I'm here with uh, Steve Faulkner, founder of game developer Infinite Interactive. Steve has been making games for over 30 years, which began with the creation of the turn-based strategy series Warlords. In 2003, he founded Infinite Interactive and released Puzzle Quest Challenge of the Warlords, a mishmash of two incredibly successful ideas, Bejeweled-type puzzle games and Warlords, an inspired combination. He has since released many more games in the Puzzle Quest series, and has also licensed Puzzle Quest for the development of a Marvel version. Steve and his team are now in the enviable position of having a consistent royalty cash flow that supports them to be able to afford to try out new games. They're committed to both creative and commercial success and sometimes spend six months on a concept that may not see the light of day. It's a wonderful place to be in, able to have the budget to develop new games without major restrictions or having to do work for hire. I'm really pleased uh, today to have Steve uh, with us. I'm really excited and looking forward to the interview. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for inviting me along, Simon. It's a pleasure to talk with you. You said that uh, in 30 years you've paid for your time uh, and you might as well work in a bank if you're going to do stuff that you don't want to do, uh, like work for hire games that you don't enjoy. Uh, we've all done it. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it may sound a little bit pretentious, but after working for a long time in the industry, it's uh, you, you feel like you've done all the bad jobs and, and you've earned a few good ones now. And and we've certainly done a fair share of work for hire in the past and not everything we've done has been original IP and I've, I've been, as you say, doing this for 30 years. Uh, and honestly, after that many titles, it... it uh, I'm at a point in my life where I want to do something I really enjoy. And if uh, I, I can't work on games that I really want to work on, um, then I would rather just earn some money and play games that I really want to play. Uh, fortunately, I can do both and it's great. You know, I mean, life is too short, isn't it really? But um... It is too, too short to play bad games. And I, I would say too short to write them, but I think there is a time in a person's career where it's, it's the right time to maybe work on some, some games that you're not a hundred percent enthused about. And that's, uh, that's okay. And, and you can learn a lot from those too. You can build up your sort of knowledge of engines, your knowledge of how to put things together, how to relate to the publishers, marketing, mm -hmm. the whole raft of skills to learn on the way and work for hire can be incredibly important in that journey. Absolutely. And it's what, uh, particularly in Australia, has kept a lot of our studios afloat over the years. So we should never, we should be certain never to go rubbishing work for hire. I mean, it's, it's not, perhaps it's not the reason why we get into the industry, but it, it, uh, it paves the way for so many people to go on and make their passion projects. And that's, uh, that makes it a really good thing. So when it came to Puzzle Quest, uh, is it, what, did you have a particular love for Bejeweled and uh, for that kind of genre of game? I did. I, I, I accidentally fell into Bejeweled. We were working on a game called Warlords Battlecry 3 at the time. And I would, um, it was one of those games. It was a lot of work on a very short deadline. And I would have my dinner and go back into the office of an evening. And uh, I would sit down and just to kind of prepare myself for working for two or three hours in the evening, I would play a game of Bejeweled because I found it very relaxing. And then after doing that for a few weeks, I found that I was playing two games of Bejeweled and then three games of Bejeweled. And I think it got to midnight one night and I was still playing Bejeweled. And I thought, hang on, I, I, I need to write one of these. And so uh, I, I kind of tucked that away in my mind for later. We shipped Warlord's Battlecry 3 and uh, we worked on another couple of titles, Work for Hire, as it turned out. And uh, while we were working on the last of those, I thought, it's time to bring out that Bejeweled idea now and, and just a uh, bit of a Christmas project. Uh, mix it up with an RPG that I'd always wanted to do and just see what happened. And really, really fortunately, it turned out that um, uh, one of the very, very, the very first prototype was a good one. And, and we kind of realized the game, the game looked good. And you say fortunately, yet it's like the second time that you've had a, a hit success. Um, do you have a secret for that? Or, or how do you come up with these new ideas and, and, and then match them to the market? I wish I had a process that I could follow because I would have more, a lot more than two successes if that were the case. But um, I've noticed in all of our successful games and we've released three or four of, over the years that have done really, really well. What's happened is I've wanted to write the game because there was something I wanted to play that I couldn't get to. Uh, I wanted to play with, with Puzzle Quest. I wanted to play an RPG that 
was very accessible in short bites. You know, not, I, I love Skyrim. I love going into a big Elder Scrolls game and playing for 100 hours, 200 hours. But I wanted something that I could play um, just when I had some downtime. And it kind of scratched that itch. Uh, but there wasn't anything really around at that time. Uh, and we did the same with Warlords. And we wrote that back in the 1980s. There weren't a lot of fantasy strategy games around that kind of fit that bill. So, and Warlords Battlecry was another RTS Warlord series um, that did very well for us in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. I wanted to play an RTS game where you had some uh, persistence between battles. And uh, every time I've had something that I've wanted to do, uh, I, I think my tastes are so incredibly average that it seems like hundreds of other thousands of people, want, hundreds of thousands of other people want to do it too. And uh, that's just very, very fortunate. I think, but uh, that's, that's kind of my process. Find stuff I want to play that isn't around and uh, make it. And uh, if, can I dig a little bit deeper as one of the things we like to do is try and get into the, you know, the places that you can't find for free on YouTube. When you're thinking about that for yourself um, and putting yourself in the shoes of the sort of the average player um, and of which you are clearly as you've just said, you're, you're sort of one of them. Um, is it the mechanics you're thinking about or the sort of uh, the compelling quality to want to get to the next level? What, what's the bit you're looking for? So I, I'm not a really big mechanics guy. I work as a mechanics designer. It's one part of my job, but mechanics aren't something that excites me. So I, I had the opportunity to work five or six years ago with a guy called Rob Murray from Firemint and we, we kind of merged their studios together for a while. And he was a brilliant mechanics guy. And he came up with games like Real Racing and Flight Control, where it was all about a mechanical idea that it had. And my brain doesn't really seem to work that way. I kind of approach it from an experience that I want to get. So with, uh, you know, with Warlord's Battlecry, for example, it was about uh, experiencing something that carries over between RTS games and feeling like I was, I was building up a hero between those games. With Puzzle Quest, it was the idea of, you know, playing a very simple puzzle game, but feeling heroic at the same time. And it's, uh, it's kind of those feelings that I design from. It's, uh, uh, that's what makes it a hard a process I can't really replicate. I, I kind of luck across it, I guess. When it happens, it's lucky. But uh, I, I, having seen it work a few times now, I'm kind of on the lookout for that feeling again. And we're working on a game last year called uh, um, Tiny Quest great little game and it was it kind of merged 1024 gameplay with heroes and, and map building and uh it felt really good it it came out and it, it wasn't a huge hit but we're working on tiny quest 2 at the moment because we certainly see something there it feels good so uh yeah we're, we're we're looking out for that all the time yeah thank you when i spoke to sony once they told me that you know sometimes it can take you know, a number of iterations to establish a, a new IP, you know, say something like Ratchet and Clank took at least uh, two, or, and also Jack and Daxter took, took at least two uh, sequels for each of those titles before they made any money back. Do you feel like with Tiny Quest 2, you've got that uh, opportunity now to build a franchise there? Yeah, we do. We, we really kind of believe in the product and uh, you just... Sometimes you feel good about a product and you just want to make a second one because you can kind of, there's something there that really, really does it for you. Um, and and uh, games as a service, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit later, is an interesting case in point because uh, with their current game that we're currently working on, Gems of War, it's doing very, very well. Uh, but as a game as a service, we don't build the sequel. We continue building the actual game itself. And, uh, and we we felt very strongly about that one, that it was going to be a good game. And it took about a year of updates for us to hit that point. So it was kind of like having a sequel. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to dive in a bit deeper into games as a service in a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Before we do that, um, I just wanted to touch on mobile briefly, because you've done very well on uh, with mobile games. Mm. Um, but when, when I look at the market, it seems harder and harder to enter the uh, market, given the a number of releases and... Uh, and the marketing costs to get any visibility. Uh, what's changed and um, how much of your budget goes towards marketing now? It's difficult to uh, be seen, but I think this has been a problem um, since I started 30 years ago. Uh, you know, we didn't have mobile back then, we had PC. The problem with being seen on PC was actually getting shelf space. Um, so there's always more noise than there is bandwidth for people to hear it. 
and particularly with games where everybody wants to make them. And I think the mobile marketplaces at the moment are just the latest iteration of that uh, small bandwidth, but large amounts of noise. I once believed that if you made it, they would come, but I have disavowed myself of that notion sometime early in my career without some form of marketing or user acquisition. Uh, you're just not going to get the people to see what you've done uh, unless you're very lucky. And it's like winning the lotto. Um, but uh, we, we're fortunate with Gems of War that we work with the publisher, uh, 505 Games, and they do our marketing and user acquisition for us. Uh, we're not really geared at the moment towards doing marketing and user acquisition ourselves. Um, with Tiny Quest, we're actually building a department to do that. Um, and that's uh, something we'll continue on with this year. Uh, and that side of the business fascinates me because it's something we've never really attempted to grow before. But, uh, it's super important I, is all I can say. And uh, as far as proportion of money that gets used on it, it varies a lot between the titles that I've worked on. Um, certainly something like Marvel Puzzle Quest, we see a, a fair proportion of money being spent on marketing. With Gems of War, it's been quite viral and it's marketed itself, but uh, it looks after itself and that's been great. We haven't needed to do too much user acquisition on that one. I can see why you'd be building an in-house team. Uh, it's such vital knowledge to have and we've got this incredible yeah. opportunity as independent developers in this renaissance where we can now at last reach our customers directly, you know, mm. without any sort of inventory risk costs, for example, which were prohibitive in the past. Um, you're working with 505 Games, and um, do, when you do the contractual negotiation, uh, do you make sure that there's a marketing commitment from them? Do you, is that something you're able to tie in at the start of the deal? I've seen deals that do tie in a marketing commitment early on. Uh, and, and actually, I, I can't remember whether we even had one in that 505 deal for Gems of War. <laughs> um, but I, honestly, I can't. And uh, But... You know, it's in the publisher's interest to market a good game. So we're pretty confident that if we can build them a good game, they'll want to market the heck out of it. And that's, um, that, that's okay. But, uh, you know, certainly getting that commitment up front is, is good if you can get it. But I don't think, um, you know, I don't imagine too many publishers wanting to commit too much large amounts of marketing up front to perhaps new, new intellectual properties, which is what we produce. Were 505 instrumental in helping you get Puzzle Quest out in the first place? So with Puzzle Quest, we worked with D3, um, and now D3Go. Uh, they, um, yeah, they, they funded the game. I mean, we, we'd taken it as far as we could get it. We needed a publisher. We were trying to move to console and handheld at the time, and we needed a publisher to come on board and kind of fund that for us. And D3 were magnificent, um, and, and we, we're now doing, uh, we've now licensed Marvel Puzzle Quest uh, through D3 um, to be done there, and along with some other Puzzle Quest titles. Uh, so they've been great, and they're instrumental for that. Uh, 505 Games have been um, you know, quite instrumental in us producing Gems of War. They, they funded the bulk of development of that early on. Thank you. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, with the Marvel deal, uh, did you negotiate that uh, deal yourself or was that through the publisher? We have an agent. Um, I, I'm a game designer, not a business guy. Uh, and and I, I sometimes feel that, you, at least for me, I can be, I could be one or the other, but I could never be both. You know, a game designer is going into a, into any situation, trying to maximize everybody's experience. And a business development guy isn't necessarily going into a business negotiation to try to maximize everybody's experience. He's trying to, he's trying to get a win out of it for his client. So um, uh, we use an agent for that, Fog Studios, and, and they're fantastic. They look after us and, and, and help us negotiate all of their deals. We're still involved in them, of course. Um, as far as dealing with uh, you know, Marvel, uh, and by extension, Disney for that license, uh, that was largely the that was largely D three. They kind of brought that deal together. What sort of deal was it? Was it was there an advance and royalties on that deal? I can't really talk too much to the uh, uh, to the exact nature of the deal, unfortunately, because that's all protected by NDAs, as you'd understand. Yeah, I'm but just... it was a fa it was it was a fairly standard licensing deal is how I would describe it. Did Marvel and Disney bring uh, marketing power to bear on the project? Was that something they brought to the table? I mean, they can't help but do that. Uh, you know, 
when they release Black Panther, we see a, a big spike in the game, for example. And it's, um, it's wow. fantastic. You know, just by the fact that they do what they do, um, it, it uh, kind of passively markets the game for us, which is really nice. Is it difficult to deal with a large corporation? I mean, I, I did a high school musical for Disney, for example, and the sign off procedure was extraordinary. They were the sort of strictest uh, people to work with, with regard to the protecting their license. Did you experience that? So we haven't, uh, our role on Marvel Puzzle Quest was um, not to have to deal with any of that. So that was all done externally, oh, which fabulous. is great because, because I don't really enjoy doing that. I've worked with some large corporations before like Nickelodeon and, um, and, and a few other publishers who've represented properties. And it's, uh, look, they're, they're all looking after their properties and I get exactly where they're coming from. But it, the, as you say, the sign-offs can be, um, can be nightmarish. Uh, it is a lot of work. And if we were going to do any kind of that work, any of that work again, I think we would specifically have a, a, a licensing guy on our side whose sole job would be to look after the licensing, to keep it away from the designers and the programmers. That you just, you know, they need an umbrella over them so they don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. What's happening with the games as a service team that you're building? Uh, when did you start changing the focus of your studio? towards free to play and, and why um, yeah so it was back in 2011 2012 uh we just um we'd been merged with another studio and they'd been acquired by electronic arts so we uh we kind of moved away from that and uh reopened infinite interactive as infinity plus two uh and we took a look at the landscape and realized that free to play was kind of where things were headed um we liked the idea of that space and we liked the revenue streams that that space could give because having previously been a company that would uh, like most companies produce a game from start to finish, then push it out onto the shelves. You were very much, uh, your survival was dependent on the game doing well. And if it did badly, or even if it did slowly, you'd quite often find yourself having to downsize temporarily and get things going again. So we, we tried to work around that by running three projects at once at one stage. And I think we had about 70 people in the studio back in the, in the late um, uh, 2009, 2010. And uh, that gave us some buffer against that. But after the GFC hit, you know, it, it was the same deal again. We had trouble signing stuff up. Some of the games moved a bit slowly off the shelves and we ended up downsizing. So we really liked the idea of revenue streams and what games as a service could do there with kind of providing a regular X thousand dollars per day that we knew would come in provided we, we gave a level of service to that game. So we restructured, we shrunk down to three or four people and we started restructuring the teams so that we had a larger customer support center and then the actual game team and the game team could work to constantly iterate and uh, release the game. And we did a small work for hire there while we were working on that, uh, a game called uh, Kwai Quest for a toy publisher, Spin Master, which was a great little game, was kind of a little game as a service. And then we progressed on to Gems of War, which is the, the big one that we're currently running. Medium size in terms of free to play games. It, you know, it's, I, I guess you would say it's not a juggernaut like a Clash of Clans, but it's, um, it's certainly very healthy. And uh, it's great, but we had to structure the studio so that there was literally one half of our people are involved in kind of customer service and support and one half of our people are involved in development. Wow, that's so interesting. And um, so did, did you start to build a, a community around that first game? Yeah, uh, community has always been a really important thing for us and, and for me in particular because I, you know, I really love game communities and I, I think since CompuServe back in the 90s, I've always been in there kind of creating communities around their games. And um, I guess I'm just kind of a frustrated community manager who, who, who never got to be a community manager. Um, <laughs> so one of our very early hires was a community manager and we wanted someone to help really build that, that community aspect. Cause I think that's, that's super important for the longevity for making people feel, you know, like they're really part of the game as it evolves which is important with game as a service, obviously you've got to keep updating that game. From there, we build a customer service departments. We've got a community departments. Now we're doing streaming. We're running kind of streaming every week and uh, always looking for new ways to uh, work with that community. It's fascinating to hear how you scale the studio up and down as well. It's um, 
you know, throughout this conference, when I've been interviewing people, um, scaling up and down has been really important uh, during lean times to help the studios survive. Mm. So a sort of future where your revenue streams are coming directly from the customer is, um, is a, an amazing opportunity. Plus, you know, coupled with the, your love for community management, it means you can tie in the whole experience. Yeah, it, um, it lets us forecast, you know, 12 months out with some confidence. And that's what you never could do before. Scaling down is a horrible thing. It's, it's like the worst part of my job is having to yeah, really. a group of people you'll have worked closely with for 12 months, 24 months, sometime in some cases, three or four years. And they have to go because you can't afford to pay them. And, and for the most part, game devs, we understand the nature of the business. We know that happens, but it is still the least pleasant part of my job. And I, I just want to do anything I could to never have to go through that again, if at all possible. Um, you know, to get to a size where we could, you know, and currently we're, I think about 16, 18 people, uh, where we can just, um, you know, gradually grow. Maybe, maybe if we need to, with natural attrition, we, we lose a couple of people and kind of drop back down to 16. Uh, maybe we grow up to 20. Maybe if a second if Tiny Quest 2 takes off and starts doing well, we start to push it out a little bit and go a little bit further. But, uh, you know, to really be mindful of that, not growing too big, but also, uh, you know, we've got that revenue stream, so we never really have to shrink down in a hurry. Yes, I mean, it can be incredibly frustrating when you um, have a, a really good team together as well. You know, and you've made the engine and everybody understands the pipeline and you're making such fabulous tech and fabulous fun. And then, and then you have to scale down. It's happened to me many yeah. times. Yeah, we've all been there and it's, uh, it's a horrible thing. Um, unfortunately, I've been kind of running the businesses since I was, uh, uh, well, since I was in my early 20s. And um, so I've always been the guy doing the firing and I, I've never been the guy who got fired. That's, I, I say unfortunately, I mean, it's probably very unpleasant to be, to be fired, but it's also incredibly unpleasant to fire people who are your friends uh, yeah absolutely terrible. well it's quite lonely as well isn't it doing that? <laughs> yeah yeah look at some I, i've had some pretty dark times uh on the back of some of those but games as a service i mean i i see that as a way out for us it's not you know i do i do quite a bit of lecturing at some of the um, australian game courses and, and universities and you know, one of the things i like to cover is uh games as a service or free to play are we evil and i say you know I, we're not evil. We're not setting out to be evil. Certainly some of the things some of us do may be questionable from time to time, but uh, if you've had to fire a bunch of your friends or be fired from a team that you really, really love, uh, all of a sudden setting up things where you have a revenue stream doesn't seem as evil anymore. And, and there's a balance, isn't there? I mean, you know, yeah. like when, when my son is, is, you know, spending, uh, you know, too much money on loot boxes. I really get to see the the dark side of that, you know, and uh, just yeah. what, just how how um, brutal that is. Um, but there's a there's a there's a sort of a, a valuable, balanced way to 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 create value where people are willing to pay a reasonable price, you know. Yeah, and, and we're here for the long term. I mean, we use loot boxes in Gems of War, um, and we've used loot boxes in Tiny Quest. Uh, but I think there's, there's responsible and irresponsible ways to lose, to use loot boxes. Uh, and, and I think it's not a case of all loot boxes are bad, uh, by any stretch, but, uh, we like to, you know, we, we have our rules and we need to sleep at night. So we, uh, we, we think that we're reasonably ethical with them. What are those rules? Um, how do you strike the balance? Oh, so, so for us, it's quite simple. I want every piece of content in the game to be available for free players. Uh, there has to be nothing locked away behind a loot box. To us, a loot box is purely something that uh, is a shortcut to something that you could get for free. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dice roll to get that shortcut or not get that shortcut. And, uh, you know, we, every single event that we run every, has to be completable by all players for free if they put in the time. And um, that's, that's just a simple rule with stuff. And we've, we've managed to stick with that one so far. And I, because we're here for the long term and we're not just trying to make a hit game and sell the company. Um, I think, uh, I think that gives us a, sometimes a different perspective on, on maybe some studios that are looking for a quick cash in, um, in that uh, I want players to come back and play my games, you know, till I basically drop off my perch. Um, I, we've certainly got players who, you know, 
played my first games written in the 1980s and they've been coming back and they've been customers of mine for 30 years. And, and I, would be, I would be heartbroken if I introduced an element to a game that made them walk away feeling like I'd, I'd cheated them or stolen their money. And yeah, absolutely. That, that's super important to me. You know, it's great to be able to, so that someone is setting a responsible example for that, you know. And, um... Well, we hope we are. Not everybody believes we are. You know, there's certainly opinions out there that we are, we are um, money-grubbing fat cat bastards. But, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, they're extreme opinions by a few people and, and there's always going to be people who have a problem with something that you do. But uh, I, I, I can sleep at night and, uh, you know, lots and lots of our players are, see value in what we give and are happy to pay for it and keep returning. So I think that's, I think, I think we're doing okay. Well, congratulations. I mean, I know how successful the product is. So uh, it's a great example uh, for us, you know, as developers. Moving away from ongoing development, um, is there a, a sort of difference in the cost balance? Is like, you know, is there a higher upfront cost for games as a service or a longer back end cost because you're you're managing the game how does it differ from the normal uh you know uh, build and yeah. so i'll tackle this answer in two parts actually there's uh to start with you've got the kind of the initial creation of the game and there's a theory out there that you know uh build the game and release quickly and release early and, and determine if it's good or not and, and then get rid of it if it's not and build it up if it's good and i'm not a subscriber to that theory. I think when you put something out there, you should always be putting your best foot forward. Now I'm quite possibly wrong about that, but that's still what I believe. Uh, and so, you know, that means there's a reasonable investment up front in, in getting the game out there with a full set of features that people will be willing to come and play and stick around for. Um, but there is, there is a huge cost on the back end to keep supporting that game. And uh, it, it costs, you know, Gems of War, which is a mid-sized free-to-play game, costs millions and millions of dollars per year just to keep that running. And that's in, um, in the money that we need to pay our developers, in the money that we need to pay for the marketing, in the money for the servers, uh, you know, all the artwork that goes into the game every week because we release multiple pieces of content every week into the game. Um, and that's, that's a serious amount of money. And when we look back, after a few years of developing Gems of War, we go, wow, that's a triple A budget we've spent there. But we spent it over such a long period that uh, it didn't, it certainly hasn't felt like a triple A development and it's not a triple A sized team. So, um, but, but I can, you know, safely say that the games like Gems of War are earning back triple A profits over the course of their lifetime um, with much smaller teams engaged for longer periods. It's uh, it's certainly an interesting model. And I think it, I think it's great because, you know, I would be, as an investor, I would be terrified to put $40 million into a game and say, yeah, we hope it's a success. Um, but it's kind of nice to put a few million in and uh, to get that game to come out and see if it does well. And if it, if it just tanks, you can kill it and, and you're, uh, you're $37 million ahead at that point, you know. Um, but if it starts to do well, you can, you can pour the money in and then... Um, uh, start kind of cranking the handle and, and earning money back out of it. And do you find um, that as you release them, they are, they'll let you know straight away uh, whether they're going to be successful or do it take time to build? And I've had a limited experience on these so far of just a few games, but it seems to me like it's 12 months to figure it out. When the game comes out as a developer, you maybe get a you get a feeling about it and you got to be honest with yourself there. I mean, I, I know people who think every game they, they make is great and, and it's not. You, I think if you can be honest with yourself, you get a vibe that the game's good. Um, it's worth continuing with sometimes like with tiny quest, we knew after six months that tiny quest one wasn't going to, wasn't going to hit the mark, what hit the KPIs that we needed. But um, we believe that number two could get there. Uh, so, so we kind of, uh, immediately sunset that game and, um, and, and went into development of the next one. With Gems of War, it took a year. Uh, we, uh, 505 and us both believed that um, there was something there. We could see the retention of players. They were hanging around. They just weren't spending enough money on it. Uh, and it was a matter of finding out what they wanted to buy. And uh, once we figured out what that was, um, we, we could scale the game and, and it did well. But yeah, I think 12 months is a reasonable time to, to keep an eye on something, if you believe it's good. 
outside of like retention and um, dollars spent, what other key performance indicators do you use? To me, retention is really the biggest one. Uh, we look at, you know, um, how many people are uh, kind of the virality of the game, the daily actives. But I think there's only three important numbers with a free to play game and that's inflow outflow and money that's spent while they're in the game. So if, um, uh, if you're not getting people in, that's, that's a big one. Uh, and if people are leaving too fast, that's a big one. And if there, there's no money coming out while they're in there, that's a big one, but they're the only three KPIs that matter to me. What types of games are suit the games as a service uh, model, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, and I think there's, uh, I think there's a couple. Um, there's, there's your kind of simple little mechanical games like um, Crossy Road. Uh, and I think, you know, a game that you can pick up and have a meaningful 20 second session in, and it can give you little, little nibble sized pieces of content. And, uh, and it can just keep, keep churning those out. And I think that's, um, they're great. Uh, we've, we don't seem to be able, we don't understand how to make those kind of games. Um, <laughs> that kind of stuff is a bit more, we really don't. It's, <laughs> uh, it's funny, it's, it's a simple game, but it requires such a unique, amazing, amazingly unique set of skills. And Hipster Whale are just so good at doing that kind of game. Um, and I said, you know, Alto's Adventure is another one along those lines it's just such a beautiful simple little game but um the real games as a service stuff for us lies in games that have uh kind of con constant content releases um they'll generally have a player versus player element so players actually become their own content uh it's very hard given that players can play a hundred hours of a these games per week, um, 100 hours of Gems of War per week isn't unusual for a lot of players. No, sorry, not 100 hours, but it's 100 hours per month isn't unusual. Um, but people playing for a few hours a night is pretty normal. They will chew through your content in a month and you can't keep up with the content pipeline. So having a multiplayer component where other players become the content is important. Having new content dropping for, uh, that changes the rules constantly. So in Gems of War, we'll have a new, at least one new troop card every week. And uh, having a game that supports some kind of event system where it, uh, it varies the gameplay up. So this week I might be um, stopping some ancient god coming through a portal, but ne next week I'm invading a kingdom and knocking down towers. And the following week, my guild is fighting other guilds in Guild Wars. Um, that variety also makes for really good, um, uh, really good games as a service. Uh, and... Uh, and you know, the final bit of that puzzle, I think, is having a, a real economy. And um, I've had arguments with economists over the fact that they say games don't have a real economy because you can just make more money. And I say, well, you know, that's true in a sense, but um, you know, everything in this game has a value. And one of those things is your time. And you're constantly weighing your time against the things that you earn from this game. And are they valuable enough for your time? I said, so there's, there's one economy there straight away. Um, and your time, you know, we can't make more of that. So all the time, that's part of our economy. That's, that's, a, real, that's a real economy item right there. And uh, if all the yeah, other stuff ties into that, the real world, if, if all the other stuff ties into that, then, then we have a real economy. Uh, so I think the games have to have an economy where things have value and there's currencies that can be spent and earned. Um, but all, with all those pieces, with their powers combined, you get the kind of the, um, the perfect storm for a game as a service, I think. Yeah, no, it sounds fabulous. I mean, do you think uh, when you talk about the variety there, um, it conjured up the idea of missions uh, for me. Um, but do you think if you were giving like episodic missions, um, that uh, you would that would be the difficulty you wouldn't be able to keep up with the production uh, pipeline and that the users would chew through the content too fast yeah and i'll give you a great example of that is uh, gems of war so in gems of war we released with about 96 hours of content uh, there's 220 hours of content uh, there were 15 wow. kingdoms that you could collect and each kingdom had a quest that you could play through and the quest had uh, 25 or 30 battles in it, uh, about a dozen missions that you would complete. And all this story and dialogue to read. And they're, they're quite, they're, they're fun, engaging little stories. They're kind of like, they've got that vibe of my first D&D campaign about them. Um, but uh, people were through that content in a month or two. 
and then we have to produce more content. So we keep releasing these kingdoms and we release a kingdom every month or two and each kingdom contains another quest line, but it fully takes us a month or two to deliver that content, but players will get through it in a couple of hours, uh, you know, two to 10 hours, they'll be through the content again. And then we've got uh, you know, another one to two months of creating that content. So they need lots of other stuff to do in between. Uh, just the, the missions that we provide aren't, simply aren't enough. Yeah, so the worry there would be that you would just simply lose their attention to other games. Exactly. They need something to do. You know, the, those missions are great and, and they look forward to them every couple of months. But uh, they've got to have you know, seven or eight more things they can look forward to while they're waiting on the next set of missions. So uh, most indies uh, seem to be working on uh, one product at a time. Um, do you know why that is? I guess for most indies and, uh, and for ourselves, when we've been really... We'll, when we've been really indie ourselves, uh, it's because we don't have the people to work on more than one thing at a time. Um, and everybody's excited by one thing and we're generally working on it and we just, we can't stop because we're all passionate about it. Um, and that's great in a team of four people. And, and yeah, I'm not sure about uh, indies in all parts of the world, but in Australia, our indie teams tend to be one, two, three, four people. And then there's kind of a, a few larger indie teams of 12 to 18 people who've had some success and uh, you know, they they need their 12 to 18 people to work on that one title. But I think in a lot of cases for us, it's um, you know, as indies, we're hand to mouth and we don't have the ability to, uh, to work on the second thing. And, and that's, that's such a huge danger. Uh, if you, you've got to be looking at the next game all the time that you're um, working on the first game, you, you've got to try to, uh, oh, Space Ape. Space Ape's a company that understands this really, really well. And they said, um, I, I went to a talk by them at uh, Austin Developers Conference a couple of years ago, I think it was. And they were talking about how they, how they tried to create their projects lean so that after their project released, they could scale back the people on it, try to earn a little bit of money from it and have those people starting on the next thing. And uh, that's so smart. Uh, and and we've, um, we've been trying to do the same thing ourselves with, with a little bit of success. We've been kind of producing the, the next set of prototypes while we're supporting Gems of War. And, uh, and I think that's, as, as indies, we've got to um, kind of be smart about uh, the games that we work on, try to make them as lean as possible. Uh, and when they're earning some money, um, start looking at reinvesting that money in the next thing. How, how many new concepts are you looking at at any one time? We've got uh, three one to two person teams looking on stuff here at any time. And, and given that we're only 18 people, you know, that's, um, that's you know, three, four or five people or so working on new stuff. And they'll be working on three things. One of those things starts to kind of move into the ascendancy. We might drop the other ones and start to start to migrate a couple of people across. But I, I, that feels like a nice number to me. And that's, that kind of keeps their, it's a bit of a reward for some of our most, um, you know, some, some of our best guys. They get to, uh, it's like, hey, take a while off this now and you can spend, um, spend a few weeks prototyping something, see what you come up with. Yeah, that's the, the, the fun end. You know, when you can afford the demo team, that's the fun end of the job, isn't it? Uh, it is, but what's interesting is given the choice, sometimes the guys say to me that I say, hey, would you like to go and work on something new? And they'd be like, I'd actually rather work on Gems of War. I'm really enjoying it right now. And so they want to work on the game that's already out there because it's, it is really fun to polish an existing project too. Yes, that's true too, yes. And how many, how many people work on the community side and supporting the, uh, the customers? Um, we have, uh, and I'm just looking out my window at them because I just want to count heads. We've got uh, five people out there at the moment. So, oh, wow. um, so that's about one third of the studio. In fact, yeah. six if you count part-time, a part-time person. So uh, one third of the studio is uh, working on community. Now that Unity is so widespread, do you outsource anything? We outsource our artwork. Um, we, we have one art director and one generalist in-house. Um, but uh, all of the artwork is outsourced to Concept Art House in China. Uh, they are an amazing house that's done work for Blizzard and Supercell and Riot Games over the years. So their work hits the fantasy genre exactly where we want to hit it. And so we, um, we outsource to those guys. I found in the past that uh, because we're in Australia, because their resources can sometimes be a bit limited, that putting together a real crack art team 
who can all match a similar style uh, of, um, of our choosing can be a real challenge. Uh, we just don't have the, uh, we've got a lot of talented artists here, but we don't seem to have that, um, that broadness of talent to get a particular style. We kind of, you know, you would end up building up an art team based around what they could manage, not what you wanted. Um, yeah. And uh, that was, that was, it's been problematic for us in the past. So we just outsource all of our artwork now. You know, for myself working on console, uh, I'd always, my, my art team would, would be a, of a larger size than my code team. And yeah. so therefore we, we one of the most costly things on the project. Perhaps you could, if you've got like three rules or three lessons learned or three guidelines that you could give to developers uh, trying to get ahead mm. to grow their studio in the current climate, uh, what would you say to them? So, so the first one is a rule I tell all of my guys in here, and that is that um, don't save good ideas, S spend them. Um, spend them on your work for hire project that you hate. Uh, you know, ideas are cheap, right? They're, you're just going to have more ideas later. Uh, and, and there's one thing I can guarantee is that you're working on the game you're currently working on, whether it's your passion project or someone else's passion project that you kind of like or a work for hire that you're not really into, um, or maybe a work for hire that you are into. If you've got a great idea, try to get it on that project. I mean, that's, um, uh, as a developer, perhaps moving up through the ranks, uh, there's no better way to be noticed than the, than the guy who had the awesome idea, you know, and, uh, I, I think people, people sitting on ideas is one of my pet hates. Uh, and I, I, I've hated a few times and I've heard it from a number of publishers over the years. That's a great idea. Let's save it for the next project. I'm like, no, don't do that. That's, that's horrible. Let's, let's use it now. If it's a great idea. Let's use it. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's my number one rule. Uh, my number two rule is, um, I guess, to try to work on stuff that you're passionate about. And, and if you can't work on stuff that you're passionate about, try to be passionate about the thing you are working on. Find the thing in it. And, and, and I, of all places, Electronic Arts taught me this, believe it or not. It was that um, they had this awful HR seminar that was about aligning your goals. And when I thought about it, it was kind of right. It was, uh, you know... Uh, aligning aligning goals is kind of cool if i can get really passionate about a game that i'm working on even if i'm not really into it and i've had plenty of those over the years um i've found that i've started to enjoy myself and when i'm once i'm enjoying myself on a project it's kind of like a passion project for me and i'm doing good stuff in there yeah so uh, there's loads of room uh, to express yourself in terms of like could be in the design could be in the mechanics, could be in the puzzles, in the missions, could even just be in the polishing the quality of the art and making it the prettiest thing you've ever yeah. made. Yeah, I mean, everything, uh, everything we make, we should take pride in and polish as much as we can and do as good a job at it as we can. And, and we yeah, should, um, and, and even if it's, you know, even if it's not your project that you really want to be working on, uh, if you can find that thing about it that uh, that you want to polish up and, and you, you find you're having a good time, I, I actually like that. And, yeah. uh, and if you do a good job, you never know when it's going to come back at, uh, and somebody might need you, you know? Yeah. And uh, and my final thing is just write lots of prototypes. We, we prototype like crazy. I prototype like crazy. Um, I'm forever prototyping card games, board games, uh, because sometimes... Yeah, um, we'll find that the actual video gameplay will fall out of those. Uh, I'm a programmer myself by trade, so I'll, I'll quite often program um, program a prototype as well. Are Every, you using your own tech for that, or in Unity? Or uh, oh, we, we're Unity now. Um, you know, I I I used to be the engine guy here for many many years. I I, I right. love writing engines. En engines are cool, but this I really can't justify that anymore. Unity's Unity's where it's at. And Unity makes prototyping just so easy, right? It's uh, all the rubbish I had to wade through before to write prototypes. It's gone. We can just prototype in Unity and an idea is brought to life within two to three days and yeah, we, can, we can see what it's like. Um, but uh, don't, don't feel, that's what I say to some of my guys because uh, we occasionally do a little in-house prototype thing where we, we mess around with some ideas. It's like, hey, you're an artist and you can't code? Sure. 
make a prototype, make me some screens and tell me how they work. Um, because sometimes that can be as much of a prototype as, as actual gameplay itself, right? It's, uh, um, prototypes come out of really weird stuff. They come out of card games. They come out of, um, they come out of board games. They come out of just screenshots that someone's mocked up to kind of you know, convey an idea. Um, but uh, just, just keep, keep making and inventing and, and putting stuff together and trying stuff out. And, and yeah. eventually you just get that thing that you go, yeah, that's, that's it right there. That's, I interviewed Mark Morris of Introversion mm -hmm. and uh, of course of Prison Architect fame. Yeah. And basically I saw one screenshot and the title Prison mm -hmm. Architect and I knew what it was. And <laughs> you know, it's just, you, you get it straight away, you know, yeah. the whole concept in one screenshot and a title. I, I like that snakes on a plane approach to, um, to doing stuff. It, uh, it makes it really, really clear. You know, that's what, when we were searching around for a name for Puzzle Quest, and and uh, our producer at the time said, "How about this name?" Because it was called Warlords Champions during development. It was we were originally making it in the Warlords franchise. And he said, "Puzzle Quest, it's a puzzle with a quest." And we're like, "Yeah, you know, that's that's great. That's yeah. what, what a good name, and it's it's uh, survived quite well." <laughs> it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've been in the business for 30 years. Mm. You must have a few hairy stories uh, from working in the industry, um, oh. both good and bad. Uh, yeah. Are there any you could share with, with our audience? So the, uh, uh, the bad story, and there's an important lesson to be learned from this one, is uh, know when to get out of, uh, out of a bad relationship, I guess. Um, we were working on a game and it, w it was a work for hire, uh, and we got it through to a milestone, and the publisher paid half the milestone, and they kind of knocked it back and said, it's not really done, we'll give you half the money. So, so we forged ahead. And this went on for another three months, and we met another milestone, and they said, you know what, that's not quite the milestone, but we'll give you, we'll give you a little bit of the last milestone to cover that. Now, any, any sane person would walk away at this point, but we'd been on the game for about 18 months and uh, about a year at that stage, I guess. And, and we just, we just blindly plowed ahead for the next 15 months, um, taking smaller and smaller payments and promises for larger and larger royalties till we realized that we, uh, we were not going to get paid. And this game was never going to be finished because the publisher couldn't afford to pay us for it, but they could afford to keep knocking us back and hopefully we'd get them a version and they'd sell it and, and maybe then they'd pay us, but probably not. Uh, you know, if I'd have walked away the very first time somebody didn't pay me for work that I knew was complete, um, we would have, uh, um, we wouldn't have had to lose 10 people that year. Uh, you know, so, so, what we do is worth money. We should be paid for it, uh, is the moral of that story. And, and, um, and don't be afraid if someone doesn't pay you and you know you've done the work to walk away. Uh, and I've certainly, I certainly live by that rule now. Yeah, that's a great um, story. Thank you. Really yeah. Good. Practical. <laughs> As for a good story, so I, I like to think we're, um, uh, you know, we make games that are multiplayer. I, I love playing with people. I've always loved playing with people. And ever since their first game, their first Warlords game back in 1989, it's been a game that you could sit around with eight friends on the computer screen and, and, and play the game with. Um, and in fact, we used to quite often just turn it onto all AI controlled sides and we'd sit there and play a drinking game where every time one of our, one of our teams won a city, uh, you know, the person who lost the city had to take a drink. And I remember a few good nights like that. So to me, gaming has been always been inherently social and coming from a board gaming background as a kid, you kind of understand why that is. But uh, we're working on Warlords 4, a, a game that it didn't, it didn't do the greatest. It was with Ubisoft in about 2004. And uh, I desperately, desperately wanted a feature where you could play Warlords 4 and you could play through the campaign with a friend. It was something that hadn't really been done in a turn-based strategy game before, but every single mission in that game we set up so that you could actually join in with a friend or with even two friends and play the game through and you could experience the whole story either single player or with friends and it would be a great game. And Ubisoft... Uh, producers didn't like it. They said it was a waste of time. I was very insistent on putting this in there. And 
And sure enough, when the game came out, uh, we got no praise for it. Nobody cared about it. Um, that wasn't the feature they focused on. But um, one year later, someone wrote to me and he said, he said, I wanted to thank you for writing Warlords 4. Uh, he said, my, my, uh, I went through a divorce a number of years ago and I lost contact with my son. And I, I, I reconnected with him in recent years and we started playing Warlords 4 in campaign mode. And uh, we played through the entire campaign. And by the end of the campaign, uh, we were actually buds again. And he said, I just want to really say thank you for that. And, that was, that was, and I'm like, that made it all worthwhile, right? That, that one comment yeah. back. So, so we named, we named uh, a quest and the most powerful item in, um, in Puzzle Quest after him and his son. And there was a quest where you were actually played, you went for Lord Michael and you had to go and rescue Lord Michael's son. Uh, I, I think it was <laughs> Robert from the ogres and bring him back. And the item you got as a reward was Robert's bow. And so Michael and Robert, the, um, the people from the story got kind of rolled into Puzzle Quest and we put that in there for them. And he wrote back to me again after he saw the Puzzle Quest. He said, I see what you did. I see what you did there. It was, was pretty darn cool. And my son says, thank you too. And I'm like, no problem. Happy to oblige that you, you know, you, you made my year in 2005 with that story. So <laughs> Uh, that's, a, that's a lovely story. Those are the sorts of things that make it all worthwhile, aren't they? You know? they, they are indeed, yeah. yeah. I remember I was working on um, Doctor Who and uh, I got to, to meet four of the doctors uh, when we did the audio recording. And it was like eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> and everybody was just coming round and having a cup of coffee. And in walks Tom Baker. And he, hand, and he holds the script and he says, so this is the piece of shit I've got to turn into gold, is it? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have a day of it here. But he turned out to be the loveliest man and uh, told us all his stories about how kids would come up to him and ask him if they could go in the TARDIS with him. And, uh, <laughs> He he just give them a pound, you know, <laughs> give them some money and say, "Look, I'm not really the doctor." <laughs> That's so good. Uh, he's my favourite doctor. I love him. That's yeah, just yeah. such a good story. <laughs> so I've got one uh, final sort of reflective question. Sure. Um, you're 30 years in the business, as we we mentioned. If you had your time again, what would you do differently? Yeah, that's great. And I, I I've often thought to myself, what what would I do differently? Because I. I've not just been in the industry, but I've been in the Australian industry for 30 years and I've never worked overseas. And I, I sometimes think if I'd have, um, if I'd have gone straight into the games industry rather than coming here via uh, some corporate IT stuff that I did in my early days, that, uh, yeah, I, I would have just been here a little bit earlier and that would have been great. And sometimes I've kind of rude the fact that I never moved to America or the UK and worked over there because look, there were some, there's some amazing opportunities to work with amazing people over there. So, uh, so many of my um, peers who I know and I'm, I'm friends with have worked, you know, with the people like Sid Meier or Will Wright or Richard Garriott. And I always feel that if I'd you know, been in America, perhaps I would have worked with those guys. Or if I'd been in the UK, perhaps I would have worked with Ian Livingston or, um, or, or uh, uh, Peter Molyneux. And, and uh, so I've never, never got to work with, the really cool people. Um, if I had my time again, part of me wishes that I just kind of packed up my bags and moved overseas and, and worked in some of the bigger companies with some of those, some of those guys. Um, but there's another part of me that's really, really immensely proud of having worked in the Australian industry for all these years and helped, um, you know, seen so many people come through a studio and go on to found their own studios in some case and, uh, and, and go on to work in other studios and, and in some cases move overseas and work for Blizzard and work for Google and work for working some of these amazing jobs. So it's, uh, it's something I think about, not something I necessarily change, but that's something I think about certainly quite a lot. You're a beacon in Australia and uh, everybody I know in the games business over there is very proud of you. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. And thank you for your contribution today as well. It's been fascinating for me. Yeah, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and some really great questions there that made me think pretty hard. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know.